Patrick, a numismatic, but... No, I'm not a numismatist. I'm an archaeologist, so I'm interested in coins that are actually found in the ground. Uh, so we're at the, at the travel's oh. edge. Um, and most of, most of coins that are newly found today are, are not found by archaeologists or by professionals, but um, are found by members of the public. Uh, and uh, in most of the cases by metal detectorists. And the, the very basic question that uh, well, European archaeology faced at the time, or heritage management in general, or across Europe faced at the time, is how do we get hold of these coins or the many other objects that are found by metal detectorists? Uh, and how do we um, make these finds enter our archaeological record, uh, at least in a, in a digital form. And uh, there have been developed some solutions to that problem. One is has already been, been mentioned, the, the Portable Antiquity Scheme, which has been running since 96, but the Portable Antiquity Scheme has been, has been, until very recently, been absolutely unique in a European context. Um, and what I want to present to you is um, our Danish approach to this problem, which is um, the Dime project. Very shortly on the background, um, Danish metal detectorists have gone through a development that I've, I've here called from devils to, to culture heroes. As in many other countries in Europe, Today, uh, metal detectorists are not, necessar ne not necessarily seen as people contributing positively to archaeology and to heritage in general, and in many cases, they don't do. Uh, however, um, in Denmark, as well as in other European countries, there is a large proportion among these detectorists who actually have a genuine interest in the finds they produce and who actually want to collaborate with the official heritage sector, so to say. Um, and that has, has definitely happened in Denmark, where even though professionals were skeptical in the beginning, uh, steps had been taken very early to establish uh, positive relations between the professional sector, between archaeologists and uh, the amateurs, the amateur finders and detectorists. Uh, and the, the best expression for these two extremes really is the front cover of the, the skull of one of the, 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 the uh, most popular uh, archaeological journals in Denmark, picturing the detectorist here of the incarnation of evil, whereas to the right, um, uh, roughly 20 years later, we see uh, the occasion of the a, a presentation of a gold bracketed board. Uh, where we see the actual finder, one of the protagonists of Danish metal detector archaeology, Klaus Thorsen, here presenting it to Her Majesty the Queen. Um, and so the right hand picture here just really shows uh, how much uh, professionals' perception, but also the, the self image of detectorists due to that, have changed uh, in this period. As a consequence of that, metal detecting has evolved, as in the UK, uh, into an extremely popular hobby practiced by several thousand people. The question is, of course, how active are these people? It's quite difficult to assess the number of active detectorists. We reckon there to be around 1,000 active detectorists, uh, which is a comparably small number if you look at the UK or other areas. Um, and around 100, 200 extremely active detectors, mostly people who are unemployed uh, or on pension and who produce the clear majority of all finds in, in Denmark. Um, the, the popularity has, of course, resulted in an enormous increase in fines, uh, which is pictured up here. Um, just in 2017, more than 10,000 or close to 10,000 objects were declared treasure trove uh, in Denmark. Um, and yeah, I'd, 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 I'd hurry. Um, 
one of the bases for the for the success you can say of, of, of Danish archaeology, where, where this relation between the tractorist and the professional sector uh, has developed into a very positive and constructive relation, is the the number and the, the high status, so to say, of the many local museums in Denmark. There are more than 28 small local museum units responsible for the archaeology and heritage in a given area. So the, the finds liaison officer system, which the pass is based on, had never uh, or was already in place in a sense in Denmark. Um, and uh, the, the clear majority, if not all, of the Danish detectors actually hand in their finds to these local museums. Uh, and are very grateful for the uh, recognition they receive for their findings. And these finds are registered at local museums. However, they're not registered in a way that they're accessible for the wider public. Um, some of these finds, uh, and not least all uh, coin finds from before 1531 or 37, I'm not quite sure, uh, end up at the National Museum where they declared treasure trove, and this enormous accumulation of coin finds and any other objects during the past 30, 35 years of metal detector archaeology has, uh, has, has also resulted in, in, uh, in some research output, not least at the National Museum. I just show this example of my colleague Helen Horsness, who most of you probably know, uh, and not least in terms of Roman Coinage. There has been an enormous increase um, in the past 30 years. Um, so the situation we're in in Denmark is that uh, we have seen this enormous increase, not only in terms of objects and object types and object numbers, but also in terms of sites uh, 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 being, being discovered, not least some of the, the most iconic sites of, uh, of Danish, Danish pre- and proto-history, places like the Iron Viking Age, Gulmen, Tusu, Tisu, and so on. Um, this has, of course, had an enormous impact on our understanding of uh, uh, the, the metal rich uh, periods and the societies. Um, and these finds, of course, have an enormous research potential. A potential which, however, is difficult to realize because these finds are not accessible to. The broader public or uh, researchers. We have varying recording practices. Uh, finds are stored in various local repositories at the local museums, um, and the National Museum is working with an access database that was developed in '87 and hasn't been updated since and is not accessible for anyone else than those working at the National Museum. So all the finds from the last 35, 40 years are basically dead data. Um, this is the background why we started the DIME project. It's a, it's a larger project group. I, want to, I don't want to introduce you to, to every single one of them. I just want to emphasize uh, one thing that I find quite important is that uh, the project is based also on a cooperation with uh, uh, the Danish metal detectorist and that the, the biggest um, association for amateur archaeologists is actually uh, on the board of the project and active in the daily running of the project. Uh, this is how DIME looks like uh, on the desktop uh, uh, user face. It's basically um, a database structure with, with two user faces, one desktop version and a mobile. Uh, mobile device version and this mobile phone version is important because it allows detectors to actually upload basic data uh, not least spatial data which are so relevant from an archaeological perspective in in the field so this is why I've talked about working at the trowel's edge earlier uh, so the, the, the basic recording of the artifact happens in the field where you log on your position and you, you register your find as a coin. Uh, you can provide a rough date for it and classify it according to the material and the find is in the system and accessible. 
um, as you saw, there's also somewhat hidden here uh, a Facebook link button here, which is quite important because detectorists have a long culture for knowledge sharing, for crowdsourcing, especially on, on Facebook, where they uh, identify each other's finds. And as you can see from, from, from these examples, they can actually be quite, quite detailed, these identification of the find here, in the case of uh, Arabic coin, and here later uh, continental medieval coin, um, where uh, peers actually provide some rather detailed identification of these objects. Um, in an ideal scenario, the detectorists on coming home from the field can then use the feedback he has received via Facebook or other channels and enrich or elaborate the, the very basic um, identification or registration he's done out there in the field in, in the desktop version, which, which looks like this. And um, this results in, in the example of a coin in a record like this, which, of course, compared to what, what I've seen earlier, is an extremely coarse uh, classification. Um, in this case, we have a Carolingian coin here, and in this case, we also have a detectorist who knows what he's doing um, and who has been able to identify this uh, Louis the Pious uh, coin quite, quite exactly, uh, even though no, he missed out the, the mint. Uh, at least he has the ruler, he has the date. Um, and the specific type. No, he has it. Venice. Uh, I don't know if it's right, um, but that's where the, the, the second step comes in, and that is the um, the uh, approval uh, yeah. of uh, the the finder's record by the local museum responsible, and. That is, of course, very much depending on the, the knowledge of those people working at the local museums in the same situation as, as with the Port Antiquity Scheme. And of course, most, uh, most uh, people working at local museums can't cover this entire span of coinage and all the other artifacts. Uh, I'm, I'm teaching these people, so I know how difficult it is for them to, to actually provide high, high resolution uh, the data for these artifacts. <clears throat> so, but in this case, uh, we again um, have have implemented um, a functionality that puts responsibility on the detectorist's shoulders again, because within the system, peers can um, provide help in the identification through this field. This is an example of uh, the most frequent coin type found in Denmark. The Civil War coins found in, uh, yeah, found in huge amounts uh, dating to the, the late medieval period, it's 13th, 12th, 13th century, which are mainly made of, made of copper. Um, and um, this guy was not able to identify it any further, which is very understandable if you ask me. But in this case, you can, you can comment on them and, and, and provide help within the dime system. And many detectors actually do that uh, and enjoy really sitting back home in the evening and provide help uh, uh, for each other. So for a, for a researcher, uh, the, the most interesting uh, aspect of the system is, of course, the output. This is the, the search uh, module. Here I've done the basic uh, query on English sterling, which results in, I don't know, it's about 30 or 40 objects. Um, and uh, this is the, the gallery um, module where it shows me all English sterling. And I can narrow it down to a certain date, uh, but that won't be much, of much help because um, only in rare cases a more specific date is actually given. Um, We've, we've been running the Dime portal um, for a very short period only. Uh, it started on the 20th of September last year. Uh, so it's only, it's still very early days. 
But still, um, we have at this point close to 25,000 uh, single objects. Uh, among these are more than 6,000 coins. So they are, uh, they constitute the, the absolute majority of all objects in the system. Uh, more than 12,000 users have registered, and that is active users or users who either do or intend to provide data uh, in the system, and 700 of them have uploaded more than two artifacts. So it's actually in, in active use, and it's also an active use at the local museums, which we are very much dependent on. Uh, so 28 of, of the 30 museums in Denmark have actually uh, registered uh, users in the system. And <clears throat> it's, it's too early really to go into the research potential of the system in itself. This is just an example of a search query on these, on these medieval, um, medieval uh, Civil War period uh, copper coins, um, where I, with just two or three clicks, can produce this distribution map. Um, and I can do that for other artifact types. Um, and we're beginning to reach a point where these uh, distribution maps uh, become meaningful in a way, but I, I think we still have a have a long way to go. Uh, we can also narrow it down to individual sites. Here, uh, one of the uh, fortifications that was used during the Second Schleswig War in, in 1864 around Sönnöbr, uh, around um, where we see uh, the coverage of um, muscle. How you call muscle loaded uh, projectiles um, uh, on this one field here of Prussian or Danish origin. Uh, so, the various possibilities what you can do here with this system. So, DIME, it facilitates recording, and first and foremost, it, it, it makes these finds accessible, which there have not been until now. And of course, our, our, our dream for the future, and we're, we're actively working towards that together with our colleagues at the National Museum, is to include all historic finds into the system as well. Uh, all finds that are stored in this access database from the 80s, um, which, which, will, which is quite a difficult task. Um, but I, I hope we will get there at some point. So that time is not only for finds produced uh, since September 18, but actually gives a full coverage also of these hundred thousands of objects produced earlier. Um, but that is a future perspective. And I think, let me just check. Um, no, no. Just very shortly on the on the international dimension of it, we're working together um, um, as the Dime Project with other similar European initiatives, not least the, the Portable Antiquity Scheme, which of course has been a, a sort of raw model for us in the development. Um, maybe um, with, yeah, the slight twist that, that, that we put far more responsibility on the, the detectorist's shoulder. And we're doing that out of, um, you call it ideological reasons maybe, but out of a desire to actually uh, use hobby archaeology as a, as a tool to, um, yeah, to, to, to realize the, the, the potential of public contribution to, to archaeology as a, as a catalyst for also democratizing heritage management in Europe in general. And of course, to, to realize the potential for citizen science and, and, uh, and crowdsourcing in, in archaeology as well. Um, but we are cooperating um, within the, the wider framework of the, of the European Public Finds Recording Network with other systems working along similar principles. Uh, and we have quite recently also joined the IATNA Plus um, project where we will feed data into, um, and that all um, yeah, holds the promise of an interesting future um, for linked data, if you ask me. And if you want to know, if you still want to know more about our work uh, on the Dime system, I just here 
provide some examples for literature that you can access through academia, if you like. That's it. Thank you.